Welcome to the Accelerating Operational Performance Podcast. I'm Greg Schenkel, President of Unique Training and Development and Frontline Leadership Systems in the USA. And our goal with our guest interviews, of course, is to bring you a wide range of insights and opinions from people in all sorts of operational leadership, from manufacturing and supply chain, and you'll gain from their wealth of knowledge. Remember our three outcomes that we want from the podcast. One is we want to give you some insights that you can use to accelerate some of the operational improvements you're trying to make in your organization. We also want you to drive employee engagement, and our guest today can really speak to that when I introduce him, is engagement, true engagement, I think, comes from knowing that you're adding value and making a difference to the operation. And third is we want to help you uh, excel in your current position or to know what it would take to get that next promotion up the ladder, and most importantly, how do you achieve better results with less stress and aggravation? So our guest today is Phil Buckman, and I want to introduce uh, Phil. Welcome to the podcast. Hi. Uh, Phil, this is one of the rare times when we uh, have someone in studio with us, so this is good because often it's over Zoom and technology. I want to do you justice, so I'm going to read your introduction. Phil Buckman is Vice President Engineering Technology at Great Lakes Copper, the only Canadian producer of copper tube for plumbing, refrigeration, and industrial markets, and it's been around since 1958. There are about 300 employees there, and Great Lakes Copper has been part of Mueller Industries since 2015. Uh, Phil played a leading role in Mueller's construction of the first copper mill in the Middle East in Bahrain, and before that, he worked with many different companies in the UK, including Mueller, and he was a factory manager at Caterpillar. Uh, Phil achieved his Master's of Engineering and Mechanical Engineering at Imperial College in the UK, and he did some post-grad work in business and management. I've uh, enjoyed, of course, our, our conversations, Phil, in, uh, including training that I did with Phil's team at Great Lakes Copper, and I thought he would enjoy hearing some of his insights today. So welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Good to be here. You know, Phil, one of the first things I think people, well, we want to give you a chance, first of all, to have some kudos. And we know that people can learn both from their successes and also from their struggles. So first question to you is, what's an example of a project that gave you that sense that you had a win? You know that confidence usually only comes after you have a couple of wins under your belt and you sort of start to appreciate them. So what's one that comes to your mind from earlier on in your career? Um the, there's been a couple, but the the focus has always been the same thing. It's always been successes with people. Mm -hmm. I've, I've done engineering um, in in a couple of different ways, but you can you can get machine improvements and process improvements. But the real benefit I'd, I'd learned um, actually it was my time in in Mueller in the UK that the real benefits that you're going to get is from engaging the people because it's the people that drive the processes. So particular thing that comes to mind. We'd just done a big upgrade on the facility in uh, the UK, the Mueller facility, and we were struggling to get the casting facility to run properly. Mm -hmm. So it was at a design rate, and we were at about 90% of that design rate. Mm -hmm. Couldn't get the team to accelerate beyond that. Okay. Worked with the team, understood that they were actually scared of the new process, mm -hmm. and they needed support in order to get over that that fear of what's going to happen if they start to run the process at the rate that it was designed to. Mm -hmm. Worked with them, uh, got through some of the, the problems that they were having in understanding how the equipment worked, and really that took it from 90% of the design rate to about 110% of the design rate. Over a period of time, um, but over about three, three or four months, really accelerated from struggling to perform to support the two facilities to excelling and having excess capacity that you could then do something with. So it, it was all about working with the people and understanding what was holding them back or why they were holding themselves back. That so you make forward. it sound like everybody, of course, knows that the success has to come from people. But I know from dealing with lots of different managers uh, over the years, and then especially people that come from technical backgrounds, they don't always have that appreciation. Mm -hmm. So I do have to ask you, where did this sort of understanding that it had to do with the people and the processes? Because I notice even on your LinkedIn profile mm -hmm. uh, that it, it talks about that, that it's about getting better results through the team of people or helping people make better results. Mm -hmm. So where did that knowledge come from? Uh, I wouldn't say it was knowledge, yeah. but it was that experience. And, and that, that actual example is, is exactly where it came from. Oh. I, was the, I was the engineer um, 
responsible for getting the process to work. Mm -hmm. So we had some process problems and I, I worked through those. And that's um, what got you to the 90% then? Is that yeah, exactly. Okay. We were, you know, maybe we were at 30% before, yeah. before we solved some yeah. of those problems. But I was, I was doing the calculations and saying, well, this is how the process should run, mm -hmm. uh, but it's not running like that. Mm -hmm. So there must be something else from a machine perspective. So I worked on the machine perspective. And then from you know, working out with the, the guys, I realized that actually it's, it was the people that was, that was the, the problem. They were, they were holding the, the yeah, process holding back, back because of, of fear of what would happen. Okay. So then I started working with the people and that was really the click to say, you can do as much as you like with the process, but you've got to have the people engaged and on board Otherwise, the process is, is never going to work. You've got to have the two things in balance. Okay, so I know that's probably going to be a common theme as I go down through some of the other questions that I have for you. So now that you talked about the uh, sort of the good thing that, that you gained a lot from solving, although it sounded like there was a problem there first and then you overcame mm -hmm. it, is there, is there similarly one that didn't turn out as well that still was a great teacher for you in terms of Either that it informed you that you would definitely never do that, you know, as, as a leader yourself or or something where despite that, it just taught you a great lesson that helped pay dividends in the future. Um, yeah, there is. There's, there's difficult things. So I've I've worked in the UK. I've worked in the Middle East. I've, I now work in, in Canada. And there are there are subtle differences between the, the cultures mm -hmm. and my expectation that people would be driven by the same things in the same type of industry mm. has, has not been as successful as you would hope, or, or as I would hope. So I've learned that you, you really do have to understand what makes people tick, because just saying, well, we have this target, we should be working towards the target, mm. you, that's not worked so well here, needing to get on board with people and build trust, build the relationships. Okay. so that people can believe that the target is achieved or is achievable rather. Interesting. So you're saying that, again, and it does depend on the culture and whether mm -hmm. people are just used to being told this is what we need to do and they just naturally buy in yep. or they you have to earn almost the right for them to agree that, yes, that, that is what we should be really focused yes, on. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Interesting. Absolutely. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Well, that, we, we could unpack that for a whole episode. <laughs> um, I wondered around... I mean, you've, you've spoken on the importance of the people. One of the things we know, uh, and I shared with you in one of our meetings a few months back of our Operational Priorities Accelerator, and just this idea that sometimes in a, um, in, a, in a factory, not maybe sometimes, probably all the time, each of the different functions or departments have their own set of KPIs, objectives, uh, work plans. Uh, the organization as a whole has a budget and a target and a goal. And yet these groups aren't always in alignment, even though they technically work on the same team. And I just just curious what you've noticed and how it how it helps to get them in alignment, what caused them to get out of alignment, just anything that you might share about that. Um, for for my experience, it's it was the incentivization and, and mm -hmm. not not here, but in a, in a previous role, um, two very different teams, one production or assembly right. uh, and the other one purchasing yes and uh, you would think that the two functions should be working hand in hand in terms of making sure that the right parts right. are there at the right time but there was a big conflict because the purchasing team had a a local goal of reducing the piece part price right and it did not matter to them they were not incentivized or challenged from a business perspective to make sure that the right part was there at the right time right so there was conflict because the cheapest supplier, which is all they were really measured on, yeah. was also one of the worst performing. So switching that around, instead of trying to really uh, individualize the, the metrics and the, the drivers, yeah. I found that having holistic targets and rewarding people on the performance of the whole team yeah. is a better way of going because then you can adjust to all of those little idiosyncrasies along the way rather than saying, well, that's your only goal for the next 12 months. Right. Then you, you tend, I find that you tend to get into the, the difficulties of conflicting smaller targets, which don't contribute to the whole performance. You get, you get right. negative competition, not positive competition. 
So, so I agree with you. And in fact, I, I, uh, I've, t I've shared this story before, but I remember one supplier and it was automotive glass mm -hmm. and they came up with a way of reducing the assembly time by six minutes, but it meant a 25 cent, a, a window essentially increase in, in, in purchase price for the, for the customer. And clearly the purchasing agent said, I don't really care if assembly time is saving six minutes. I get I get measured on the purchase price and I'm not giving you a 25 cent increase. Yep. So the six minutes of assembly time was worth uh, magnitudes of 25 cents per, uh, per glass. Um, so that really illustrates what you're saying. I'm curious about another common, I guess, conflict sometimes, even though they're on the same team, is maintenance and production, especially in an asset-rich mm -hmm. organization like the companies you've worked for, right? Lots of big equipment, depending on their ages, they need a lot of uh, TLC to keep them running well. I'm just wondering, how have you viewed maintenance and production in different situations you've been in, in terms of getting them to cooperate? Yep. Um, I've, I've been fortunate and cursed in some ways in that a lot of the time I've had accountability for both production and maintenance. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's are, an asset most of the time, by the way. I, I agree. Yeah. Um, although usually it's been in a business that's had a lot of history where they haven't always had right. the same, um, same level of accountability or the same, same person accountable for both. In which case there's, there's traditionally a conflict between we need the machines to maintain them. We need the machines maintained so that we can run them. Yeah. And that time conflict is is So it's the availability sometimes. of the machines where maintenance might need the machines more in production saying, I really can't give you the machine any longer. Like, what can you make happen? Or why can't you get it up and running faster? Or, yes, or exactly. maintain it in less time? Or, yes. Okay. And, and why can't you get it back to us in the time scale that you said you would uh, when it's, it's a root cause that has to be identified and found and solved? Right. Um, and then usually there's craftsmen involved or craftspeople yeah, involved yeah. Um, who want to do the best possible thing that they can with the machine. Right. And sometimes that's not the most practical thing from a, a business yeah. perspective. So and it's tough to tell someone who cares a lot about the work that they're doing to say, I know you'd ideally like to do this. What would give us the, make it viable to run production? Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, so at, at Great Lakes, yeah. we've installed a, um, some software which allows us then to track and say, okay, this is the this is the repair that's going to be done in the in the fight of the fire, yeah. but we will follow up and record that follow up later. Oh, okay. That's helped. That's a okay. that's a good thing. It doesn't it doesn't take away completely that reliance on production needs the machines and maintenance right. wants the machines to maintain them. Yeah. But having everybody together and understanding that there's one common goal, which is satisfying the customer, yeah. and we we have to find that balance between the two. Sometimes it's it's a production focus. Sometimes it's a maintenance focus that is needed. It, it flips between the. So the you two. just get. It sounds like what you get used to is just keeping the channels of communication open, yes. so that. And also, what's what's evident there, and what you said is that, it's not that one doesn't care and the other cares, hmm. and they both care. They both care actually maybe a lot, and. What uh, what they need to do is to I guess care about the shared uh, goal. Um, and, and this goes back to, I know you've, you've played rugby before, it's, it's, it's like it's a team sport and it's never about one individual, but you need individuals to fulfill their roles Yes. and, and do what's expected of them. But I think the, the key is, if, if there was any, any such thing as one key, um, there's a key which is making sure that people see things from the other person's perspective. Mm -hmm. And then you have sympathy and empathy, yeah. you have some common understanding, you'll still have conflict. Yeah. But you need conflict in order to, to drive improvements, yeah. I think. Positive conflict, right. not negative. Right. Right. Um, but when you, when you have people who don't understand what the other person's perspective is, then you can end up with frustrations yeah. and lack of understanding and selfishness. Yeah. And the, yeah. if there's one thing that I try and do is try and to get people to see things from each other's perspective, right. they go, oh, that's what you're trying to do. Yeah. Okay, well, we can help with that. Here we go. Oh. Which takes a bit of patience as you know, because you get people who are hard. Well, it's one thing when you're one of the parties who's also maybe dug into a position, but when you see other people do it, at least then you can play, uh, I suppose, a facilitator or orchestrator. Um, I'm, 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 um, I'm curious with all the, f the tools, all these shiny tools that are available in manufacturing to make improvements. Uh, mm -hmm. And some of them are 
literal shiny objects that don't seem to stand the, the test of time, even though they're valid toolkits. I'm thinking like there was a big craze on Six Sigma, which is still very useful for very high volume uh, operations, right? It is. Where you have lots of repetition, you can use statistics on that. Uh, then, you know, more conventional lean 5S, um, continuous improvement. And we know that a lot of companies have tried to emulate Toyota and the Toyota production system because it is world class and they really have been the most committed to it over the longest period of time. And other companies kind of come into that and they cherry pick through the toolbox and find something that's exciting and they want to implement that and then they never really get the full results. And I wondered whether you've obviously seen the implementation of these various things both well and poorly. What's your take on the use of some of these improvement tools and methods? Why why don't they stick in some organizations? They do in others. Uh, I think some organizations uh, underestimate the amount of effort it takes to change. Mm -hmm. And when you have um, two, three, seven hundred people who are used to doing things in a particular way, to come and change that way and suddenly start displaying how they're performing, displaying the things that they're doing to the rest of the team and saying, this is the things that we got wrong and this is how we're going to make it better. Some people see that, I think, as, as a, this is just what we got wrong and there's a blame. Yeah. So the effort that it takes to sustain the, the methodology and the improvements is, is where I think a lot of people go wrong. Okay. They, they look for quick wins mm -hmm. rather than looking for, um, this is how we want to do things in the, in the far future. Yeah. So a lot of people talk about low-hanging fruit. What's the low-hanging fruit we can do yeah. here? But that, that doesn't, for me, drive no. the mentality. It makes it that too easy almost. It, it is, and it, way, it, yeah. it means that people are expecting that this is going to be a quick win. Yeah. And it's, it's not going to take much effort. We're going to get loads of benefit from it, and then we can move on to the next thing. Yeah. Instead of saying, no, this is how we want to be in 30 years' time, mm. then you have an appreciation that there's, there's a long journey to go on, uh, and we're making steps to get to where we want to be. That, I think, sets the right mindset. And it also means that you know that you're going to be doing this for effectively forever in terms of your career. And then you get the short-term benefits as well. But if you just say we're going to get some, some short-term benefits, I think people miss the long-term ones. That's true, yeah. And I think what I think the tension is is that there's short-term requirements, let's say, built into the targets for the year. Mm -hmm. And then people say, well, this this shiny thing, it's like me getting a new app on my phone thinking it's suddenly going to make me better organized. Mm -hmm. well, I can learn French in five minutes. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. No. So, so you're saying it's better for, for at least the leader to know it's going to take some persistence over time and that people are going to take time to, to first understand it then to understand how it's a difference and a shift and then that they can be successful at it and then get the support they need. Like so, so you still have to drive for the change, but at the same time have this patience and support and encouragement along the way. Is yes, okay? and recognize that it's going to be a lot of hard work, but it'll have a lot of reward. Yeah. If you start talking about, oh, this is going to be easy, I think it sets up the wrong mentality. So worth, not, not just in the while, leader, but in the whole team. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, All I good things it. come to those who put a lot of effort in. Right. <laughs> right. Um, now you talked about low hanging fruit. Uh, is that I wondered when you because you you talked about that that project where you got ninety percent to where you needed to go and then mm -hmm. you know, it took a little bit longer to get the other ones. Um, have you ever fallen in the trap yourself in a positive way? Like you got some quick wins on something and then thought, oh, this is like, oh, this is going to be easy. And then it, and is it? I don't know whether you've, you've experienced that or not. I have. I have. And um, I speak about this with, with my boss quite a bit. Is whenever, whenever I get the, the internal emotion that things are going well, yeah. things fall off the rails. And you think, ah. So I, I try and cancel myself and say, no. Just remember, there's a lot of lot of hard work to go Lots through. Of ups and downs, yeah. Exactly. My my sister said, gave me some advice when we had children. She said, "Remember, everything's a phase. The good stuff is a phase, and the bad stuff is a phase. Don't worry, it's all just a phase." And you, you I think in in business, you have to remember the same things that you've got to put the effort in if you want results. And the moment that you sit back and celebrate, you're you're in for some some harder yeah, times. You have to stay you have to stay hungry, which also means you shouldn't. You shouldn't be overly upset when things aren't going well because they won't go poorly forever. And you should also know that um, 
uh, when they're going well, that that probably doesn't mean you won't have more problems ahead. And it's like, you, you, so keep your celebrations relatively short. Seven seconds. <laughs> okay. Seven, seconds. Like Seven seconds to celebrate. Then I you like can continue. That. Um, I wondered about, um, uh, I know one of the models I shared with you one time, and I, have, I want to maybe rephrase it, but it's decision-making waste, which says that you have some senior people who are responsible for certain things, some, some middle leaders who are responsible for certain things, some frontline leaders, and then the team members. And the challenge that comes when a more senior operations person is now solving problems that should have maybe been taken care of at a level or two lower. Mm -hmm. And, but you don't want to not be supportive. I just wondered how you've dealt with this, I'm sure tension and, and sometimes being drawn into situations that really shouldn't be your problem. And if they are, you don't want to be down there too long. I just, how, how do you deal with that so that you get to stay enough of your attention on the medium to longer term horizon and maybe bigger opportunities and make sure the other people know what their role is in owning mm -hmm. owning the decisions lower on in the organization? Uh, honestly, that is an area where I am doing a lot of work on myself to okay. make sure that I don't get involved in too many of the decisions that I shouldn't be getting involved in. So a lot of self-reflection after the event and saying to myself, okay, I shouldn't have got involved in, in making that decision, so how can I now retrospectively address that with the, the team involved and say, okay, well, what's the, the learning points from there? So trying to help the, the team to reflect on what they could have done with the aim of them doing it themselves for the, the, the next time. I'm, I'm not super strong in that area of mm -hmm. not getting involved in things. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I wouldn't be able to give too much advice other than to say that yeah. if somebody wants to talk to me. You're aware of it. Yeah, yeah, I'm absolutely aware of it. You're aware of it. It's, it's, it's interesting. I think that um, another guest had shared that you're inclined to want to solve problems, first of all, mm -hmm. and you're inclined to want to help. And so when there are problems and people seem to be struggling, it's, it's, it's very hard not to be attracted to, to fixing it or even commenting on how somebody might plan to fix it mm -hmm. um, until they've had a chance to do it and maybe get some feedback on how it went or not. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's working out what the real problem is that I should be solving. Right. It's exciting and, and in some ways a little easier to solve the problems that the team is having because most people who are in a senior position have come through the, right. the, the system and they know how to solve those problems. Yeah. So it, it takes less energy. But then you have to sit back and think, well, actually the problem I've got to solve now is how do I make sure that other people are able to solve those problems? Yeah. And reflecting on, and that's my problem now to I've solve. I've got a different question, because uh, you, you've, you've grown in your career and had more responsibility as, can, as happens with things are going well. And how have you dealt with, you know, when you're in a, a more junior role for a while, but then, you know, you, you know you're hopefully being considered for a different role, how do you balance that you need to execute the current role really well, but you're really trying to position yourself for another role? Have you have you have you wrestled with that in your career before? Or or is it just, yes. just do, do your job that you're assigned right now and not worry about the other one? What what, what do you think? Um I've I've never planned my career moves and, and things like that and said, oh, this is what I've got to do in order to get to that oh, okay. next level. Um with the exception of thinking to myself that I should really be doing the job that my boss is doing so that they can do the job that they want to be able to do for the yeah. benefit of the organization. For me, that seems to have worked. Okay. Um, but I don't think it's, it's not been strategized no. for, for me in any way other than wanting to help my team and my boss to do the things that, that they right. should be able to do better. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm not sure if that's no, that, if that's, no, the, that, that's good. an I mean, accurate answer, but that's that's how well, it's worked it, out for it, me. It, it, it came up for other people because sometimes if you're ambitious, and we know some people who watch this podcast are looking for those tips on how do they you know get better at doing their role and then maybe earn a promotion in the future. And I think if you're chasing the promotion too much, uh, what you're really saying is deliver value, deliver value yes. obviously to the organization, but del you're delivering value for your current boss or manager. Um, you're helping your team generate the results that they need to. Good things tend to happen when people generate wins, right, or deal with difficult situations. Mm -hmm. uh, one tip I always say to people is, remember, not that your job is to make your boss look good, but it certainly helps if you help your leader generate the results they're supposed to generate because mm -hmm. first they appreciate it, but also then you're recognized as a person who helps generate results, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. 
Now, one of the things that plagues a lot of leaders these days, uh, Phil, is around motivation um, and how it's changing. I mean, you kind of spoke to this just in having worked in different cultures and just shifting and, and getting and understanding different cultures and how long it can take sometimes to get people on the page and to build the trust and so forth. But what do you say to leaders who are struggling with what they perceive as multi-generational uh, changes in motivation? Do you have a take on that? Do you think it's mostly just uh, used by consultants to sell books about the generational changes? Or like what what is it about generations that are coming up? And I'm sure you're seeing them in your workplace where you're having people retiring out after a lot of years of experience and you have newer people coming into the workforce. Any Any insights you have or advice that you'd give to someone as they think about that? There is. Um, and it might be uh, contradictory to a lot of the books yeah, that you read, yeah. but ignore the generation. Yeah. Deal with individuals. Find out what it is that makes individuals tick and genuinely get to know the team, understand what it is that, that they're interested in because sweeping generalizations are often wrong. And I know that's a sweeping yes, generalization, yes, but yes, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, try, I, I try not to get caught in that trap of, well, that person's young, so therefore, well, that person's older, that person's got longer service, so therefore this is how they think, it, it, it almost always ends up with egg on your face. Right. So individuals are individuals. Yes, and individuals are. And I think that's probably important, not just talking about gen generations, but teams, uh, departments. And we have this, uh, we have a session that we do, it's a, it's a newer session for us, but on not so much, well, I guess cultural awareness and cultural collaboration and just how, how easy it is for silos to build and judgments to build. And one of the quotes in there, and I'm, I'm going to paraphrase it because I don't have it exactly in my mind, but that it's not that stereotypes aren't accurate, it's that they're incomplete. And which means that if you buy in too much to the stereotype, you kind of give up any of the power and influence that you have over the situation. So there may be some generalities around yeah, use of technology and and how people were schooled or raised, but irrespective of that, they're human beings who still want to achieve things and do well and learn and grow. And uh, so I like your concept of getting to know them as individuals. Mm -hmm. Now, was there any other sort of piece of wisdom that you that you thought as I as you knew where you kind of on the podcast? And of course, I gave you a few things that I wanted to chat about, but I wondered if there's something I didn't ask you about or explore that you wanted to share. Um, I, I think the. The most important thing is be genuine. I, I hear a lot of people talking about, oh, you've, you've got to allow people to think that they've got a say in things. No, you've got to make sure that people do have a say in things. You've got to care about all of the people that work with you, around Not you, for you. Not pretend that you care. Not yes, pretend yeah. that you yeah. care. And if you, if you find yourself trying to do something because you've read it or because somebody's given you advice that that's what you should do without really believing that's how you are, I think that, that means you're, you're not yet ready to, to actually put those sort of tools into, into place. It's, leadership is it's a collection of tools to help you along the way, but I believe your heart has to be in it and you have to want to do it right for the team around you. Oh, good stuff, good stuff. Well, that's why I've enjoyed talking with you because you, you do have a good... Uh, on the ground perspective, especially it's always uh, I think it's always heartening to have someone who has a more technical role in a technical business who recognizes that really that the technical skills give you a nice base mm -hmm. uh, or to use a bicycle analogy. I know you're big into bicycling. It's like it's the driving wheel is your mm -hmm. technical knowledge. The, the people side is all the steering that will eventually get you to the destination. Uh, otherwise, you'll just be on a, I guess, uh -huh. on a stationary bike at that point. The analogy breaks down at some point. <laughs> um, so, first of all, thanks to Phil Buckman to, to, for joining us. Certainly, um, Great Lakes Copper, if you're interested in that business, you can uh, uh, read about them at glcopper.com, I Correct. believe is the website. And then Phil Buckman can be seen on LinkedIn. Uh, that's uh, He has a great profile on there. I think that you'll enjoy connecting with Phil. Phil, thank you so much. Uh, remember, folks, if you uh, want more information about uh, accelerating operational performance, about the services that we offer at Unique Training and Development or Frontline Leadership Systems, reach out to us on our website at uniquedevelopment.com. And remember to uh, like and spread the word on the podcast. Leave your comments below. We really look forward to your engagement. For now, we'll say we're signing off. Thanks for listening.